Good morning, my name is uh, Emmanuel Katrakis. I'm the Secretary General of uh, URIC, uh, the European Recycling Confederation. I'm also coordinating the leadership group on economic incentives of the uh, European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform. I'm extremely glad to um, have this uh, session today on economic incentives with a focus on extended producer responsibility schemes. Um, I think, and it has been said throughout the uh, this annual conference that uh, incentives are absolutely essential to support the transitions towards a more circular economy, especially to make sure that uh, the positive externalities that uh, circular materials, circular products do uh, um, provide uh, to, to the environment and to, to the economy are properly priced and uh, basically also to level the playing field with uh, economic activities, which uh, obviously uh, I'm going to, um, we have today a very interesting sessions with a variety of speakers. Um, uh, so we have uh, an introductory speech by Joachim Coden, who is the managed director of, of Expra. Uh, we will have a then, but uh, a very interesting uh, discussion with um, uh, a panel discussion animated by Arthur Tenvolt, uh, who is managing Ecopreneur. Um, with an intervention of um, the European Commission from Sylvia Eile, who is Deputy Head of Unit of uh, DG Environment. Uh, I will also take part in the panel discussion to provide the, the recyclers' view on economic incentives and, and, and PR. And obviously, we also have, as part of um, the panel discussion, Timothy Glass, who is Head of Corporate Affairs for Werner and Metz, uh, as well as Marco Musso, who is policy officer at the European Environmental Bureau. Um, we want to have this uh, um, workshop as interactive as uh, possible. Uh, this is why uh, um, we are going to have two ways for all participants to take an active participation in today's workshop. We are going to use a poll and we are also going to use uh, a MARA board uh, which uh, Cynthia Reynolds is going to, to explain in a few minutes. But before giving the floor to Cynthia Reynolds, I want to, to, to give the floor to Arthur Tenvold for the first question we want to, 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 to put in, in the poll to, to kick off uh, the, um, this, uh, this uh, panel, this, this uh, workshop. Yes, thank you, Emmanuel, um, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, moderate this uh, session, um, which I hope will be very interactive. Please also feel free to launch uh, questions in the in the participants uh, chat. And now, indeed, I would like to um, to launch the first poll. I hope it works. I'm clicking on it now, and it's a very um, yeah introductory question. We would, are looking forward to hear how familiar you how familiar are you with extended producer responsibility uh, not at all or a bit or fairly fairly familiar or you're an expert if everything works then you should be um, seeing uh, this question now i see no results yet but we were told that um, uh, that it should be take 20 seconds before it's launching and it i see something coming in green now and uh, so that I hope that it really means that you are uh, seeing the question. Um, I can see nothing now because I'm looking at the poll. <laughs> Joachim, do you see anything? Sorry, um, yeah, Joachim, but also Emmanuel. Is the poll running or should I do something create poll? Running. Okay, yes. Okay, so the votes are coming in now and it's the peak is at fairly familiar four experts one not at all okay i'm just waiting until they come and then maybe already um introduce uh joachim so uh joachim is the managing director of uh, expra and um he will give um to start with this uh, session 
uh, a brief introduction of the extended producer responsibility concept. Um, we're glad to see that there are some experts and also some fairly familiar, but still also the experts find it complicated. And so to have a good discussion, um, I would give the floor to Joachim in a second, but first let's take uh, a look if this, yeah, well, I think this is final. So, okay, thank you for, uh, to, for telling us a bit about who you are yourself. And now I would like to give the floor to Joachim. Yes, thank you very much, dear, uh, dear Arthur. Uh, are you able to hear me? It works, yeah. So, super, thank you very much. So I will go on very quick, quickly seeing the time. Uh, just Expo Extended Producer Responsibility Alliance. We are a club of 27 EPR systems uh, from U Europe, but also from other countries around the globe, like Canada, like Chile, Turkey, Israel. So uh, I think a lot of uh, experience and ideas uh, within our network uh, mirroring all the different realities, because if we believe it or not, uh, the situation is different in all the countries and not like, uh, like in Belgium or in the Netherlands everywhere. Uh, the concept of EPR, so why, why uh, are politicians, why are industry in the meantime quite attracted by EPR? And this is, uh, from my point of view here, the optimal situation uh, where the, the producer responsibility organization, which has been uh, founded uh, and mandated by obliged industry to keep this circle of packaging, but I think uh, it is uh, very similar for we, for batteries, for lighting, for whatever product you are putting under EPR, where we are in the middle and trying to keep this circle running, running in the best way, like a wheel uh, if we are cycling, so as more round, as easier the circle is turning. Uh, we know that there are financial gaps, especially for the collection, for the sorting, sometimes even for the recycling. So we have to collect the necessary funding from obliged industry to close this gap. But there are also a lot of knowledge gaps and best practices gaps at every part of, of, of the, of the circle. So, uh, the PRO should work with the, the fillers, the pa packaging producers to translate the needs of the recyclers and the waste management sectors to them so that they design their packaging in a way that it is collectible, sortable, and finally re recyclable. We have to work with the uh, inhabitants, with consumers, so that they can take an informed decision what packaged products to buy and where to put them the packaging in the right bin, in the right sack, however the system looks like. So a lot to do for the PRO. So it should be a strong PRO. Uh, of course, we are financed by obliged industry. So of course we have a, we are close to obliged industry, but to keep this uh, circle turning in the best way, we should be as independent as possible because we always have to promote the best solution, the best for the circle. Uh, for the environment and taking into account, of course, as much as possible, carbon neutrality uh, uh, as well. So circularity and carbon neutrality at the same time. We learned a lot over the last 30 uh, years, and I'm extremely happy that with the uh, revision of the Waste Framework Directive in 2018, a lot of these learnings were taken on board. So the so-called minimum requirements for EPR were put into legislation and were agreed by all member states, by the Commission and by the par Parliament. So I think it is very important that they are implemented now. And there we see a lot of difficulties and problems in, in, in the various member states. Either they just don't implement them at all, uh, either they just pu put them on paper, but don't do it in reality. And of course, in reality, a lot of steps are missing, like enforcement and so on uh, in many member states. So for, for us, the most important thing is at the moment, please uh, introduce our minimum requirements so that the EPR systems can start uh, to take the necessary investments. Uh, here, I would like to, to use the Belgium examples, uh, we, we, which have a stable 
legislative uh, environment, which have a, a stable agreement somehow with the government what, what to do. So they were able to take the investment that five brand new sorting plants were built or are being built now all over Belgium. New recycling plants are built so that the necessary investments could be done to fulfill the new targets and to make our packaging circular. And I hope the same will happen in all the member states as soon as we follow uh, these minimum requirements, these key principles that you can see here as, as well. Uh, and as we will discuss uh, fee modulation to, to today, I think it is important to remind us that the fees are collected by the PROs to close the financial gap, to, to have enough funding to do all our jobs, including communication, education, et, et cetera. And they are calculated per material, but per the costs of each material. And the fee modulation in our, in our membership is calculated in the same way, just one granularity further. So the fees are usually not a political instrument to punish certain packaging. And as PRO, we would even not be allowed, for example, for antitrust me 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 matters to punish packaging without neutral justification. That's why we are trying to, to give the packaging the right costs. But we cannot say, from my point of view, this packaging could pay 10 times more than another pa packaging because we have a feeling that it is a bad packaging. Feelings are not for EPR. We have to, to be as neutral uh, and as justified as possible. Of course, we could talk for hours about this topic, and I'm always happy to answer all your questions that are popping up. And I give the floor back to our great moderator. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joachim. Um, and then I would now like to give um, the word to Cynthia Reynolds, because um, yeah, this overview by, given by Joachim provides maybe a base ground for the discussion. And Cynthia will present a like a platform for the discussion um, also outside of our own session. So Cynthia, please take the floor and I hope it works with sharing your screen. Thank you, Ette. Uh, the Leadership Group for Economic Incentives have identified a series of data points relevant for the mapping of EPR schemes across EU member states and beyond. This workshop aims to provide additional insight to those who are seeking a deeper understanding of EPR schemes, to gather insight from experts in the field of EPR, and support the development of a shared intelligence with common data sets for best practice mapping. EPR schemes can be categorized and therefore analyzed in a multitude of ways, such as the type of EPR, including product take-back systems, end-of-life waste management fees, advanced disposal fees, mandatory deposit refund systems, recycling incentives and disposal disincentives, or by modulation, with basic fee modulation, advanced end-of-life with granularity, advanced end-of-life with bonus malice, or advanced life cycle with bonus malice. They can also be classified by criteria, category, as well as many other factors. You can access the Miro board with this QR code. A link will also be provided in the chat. There you will find a breakdown of the previously identified data sets, as well as a space for stakeholders such as yourself to provide additional input. This input can include additional recommendations to add to the existing list, critiques, comments, and or questions. You simply need to fill in a post-it note with your input. Due to the fact that this type of input requires time to first understand the provided information, as well as enable time for reflection, this board will remain open for stakeholder input until end of day tomorrow. The results will be included in the Leadership Group for Economic Incentives Orientation Paper on Extended Producer Responsibility. Should you have any questions, my contact details are also on the Miro board, and a link should show up soon in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. And I hope indeed that you will see the link. I don't see it myself yet. I have the link, but I cannot post it in the chat. So uh, I'm sure that the techni technical people will make uh, make this happen. And then now I'm pleased to, um, yeah, to go on and start our panel discussion. 
um, with the speakers that were already uh, introduced by Emmanuel. And we're also happy that uh, at the beginning of this meeting, also uh, Sylvia Eile, Deputy Head of the Unity GDM, DG Environment from the European Commission, was able to enter this session. So I would gladly give the floor to you to update us on what is happening on the side of the European Commission. Uh, super, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, good good morning still to everybody. Um, so, indeed, I will give you um, an, an update uh, on what are the current Commission activities in, in the area of uh, extended producer responsibility. Um, and also, I mean, first of all, uh, before I start, I uh, just want to thank uh, yeah, for, for the invitation to the event because it is extremely useful for, for the Commission to, to hear back from, from the stakeholders uh, uh, in terms of what they see as uh, yeah, areas that uh, we should prioritize for uh, future policy improvements. Um, so I th it was already uh, recalled the, uh, um, that EPR is indeed a very uh, useful and very um, effective economic instrument to improve um, the waste management uh, in, uh, in, in the member states. Um, and indeed, it is it is a complementary and an, an, an enabler to meet specific uh, waste management um, uh, requirements uh, and, and and targets that are currently set at EU level um, and uh, also at uh, at national level. So it has proven to be a very effective tool to finance um, waste collection uh, and, and treatment, and, and especially to manage that uh, that relationship also with with, with the consumers that are um, uh, at at, uh, at the end disposing of of these products. Um, EPR has also potential to to facilitate uh, product design changes uh, when it is effectively designed, uh, and also to complement in in that way um, any product rules that are actually set uh, for for access to to the EU market. Um, and yeah, currently we have in in the EU one of the broadest set of uh, EPR rules. Um, uh, globally, um, so both at, at EU level, but even more at, at national level, since there is uh, uh, yeah, a number of uh, countries uh, in, in the EU that uh, use this instrument uh, uh, quite, quite extensively to meet uh, the different waste management um, uh, objectives they have set. Um, well, currently, we at, at the EU level, we are at a rather unusual situation because um, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, member states are currently uh, transposing and implementing the the new require minimum requirements on extended producer responsibility schemes that were uh, adopted in the, in in 2018, um, and then uh, to be transposed uh, within the national laws uh, um, by the year 2020. So there's a lot of uh, changes already happening on the ground and, and discussions with the um, obliged uh, stakeholders. On the other hand, uh, we also have. Um, new rules that were adopted in 2019 which uh, introduced new extended producer responsibility obligations for single-use plastic uh, products um, and uh, fishing gear and also introduced uh, specific uh, rules for EPR in terms of uh, cleaning up of uh, litter and preventing uh, of litter. So this is yeah quite Quite uh, significant changes that the, the both the member states and uh, and uh, and the industry um, uh, are now dealing with uh, to to bring uh, bring on the ground, and then on the other hand we are we are in in the process of implementing um, our green deal, which um, envisages that we will gradually. Uh, revise um, our existing waste uh, uh, waste acts. Um, you know, reflect and, and and see how we can still, um, yeah, how we can update them to to meet the circular economy uh, principles. And so there are a number of uh, legal acts that are currently being revised, and that also um, uh, provides an opportunity to look uh, further. Uh, into the rules uh, and, and fine-tune the rules of on, on extended producer responsibility. And so um, the first uh, first such measure that um, 
we have taken uh, since the adoption of the Green Deal was the revision of the batteries, uh, 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 batteries and batteries waste uh, legislation, where the the Commission had the objective to harmonize the way waste management uh, is done across the EU, including the rules on extended producer responsibility, really uh, to ensure that there is yeah, uh, benefit also to an, an, a level playing field uh, for, for the economic operators in, in this sector. And so that also specifically concerned extended producer responsibility rules, where we aim to harmonize rules on, on producer registration, producer authorization, um, uh, producer responsibility organization authorizations, uh, including their objectives and uh, fee modulation. Um, so this Act currently is in in co decision, so we are yet to see what is the the outcome of uh, of this um, commission's uh, intent. Um, but uh, yeah, we will see very soon, since uh, it is one of the, the the political priorities to to come to political agreement on this act um, uh, with the within this year. Um, and so then uh, we also have um, a number of. Uh, uh, upcoming initiatives uh, in relation to the waste from a directive, uh, end of life vehicles and, and packaging, where uh, we also aim to tackle uh, um, and, and to revise uh, our rules on external producer responsibility. Again, with the main principle in mind that we would like to ensure as much as possible harmonization and as well to bring it more in, in line with the with the with, with the yeah the green deal uh, policies which um, for example put a lot of emphasis on waste prevention so we will um, yeah the area that we'll be trying to look uh, very actively and also together with our stakeholders is how um, uh, how we can uh, uh, ensure that also EPR um, among other uh, tools um, could actively substantially contribute to the waste prevention uh, objectives uh, uh, of, uh, of the EU. Um, and furthermore, maybe two last points is that we also look, will be looking at potentially expanding the extended producer responsibility to other product types. Uh, so one notable mention is for, for textiles. Um, so you will see more on that in the upcoming uh, commission's uh, strategy on textiles, which will be adopted uh, later this month. Um, and uh, the last point I want to mention is on uh, the uh, aspect of enforcement. So this often comes up in the discussions with the stakeholders, also with the, the enforcement authorities in, in the member states. Uh, so this is something that we're looking at. So in particular, in the context of uh, online uh, sales, of, uh, of products that are subject to extended producer responsibility, uh, really having in mind uh, to ensure that level playing field uh, across uh, the different uh, actors of the obliged uh, industry. Um, so we're looking at uh, how we can improve this uh, regulatory um, framework uh, in line with the ongoing discussions on the Digital Services Act, which is currently in co-decision, uh, uh, which, which aims to regulate the obligations on uh, online marketplaces. So overall, this is, um, yeah, this is uh, a short summary of uh, the, the current activities uh, and the future activities on EPR in the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for this uh, overview of all that you're doing. Um, then I would like to um, go to uh, Emmanuel Katrakis um, for a brief summary for uh, his perspective and then we move to the other panelists um, and then we will have a discussion. So Emmanuel, please take the floor. Thank you. I'll try to be brief uh, to, to, to explain how Maine as recyclers um, objectives, um, opportunities, but also sometimes concerns when it comes to EPR. I think one of the decisive factors with EPR schemes has been the uh, revision of the waste from directive and the introduction of the modulation of fees. Um, up until uh, recently, fees paid by EPR were solely based on the, the volumes, the quantities, the units uh, placed on the market. And, and one thing where EPR schemes uh, have a, a real uh, room for improvement is to basically, through the modulation of fees, 
the fees paid by obliged industries to EPR to, 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 to finance the collection sorting and also the communication that this modulation, that these fees are being modulated based on uh, criteria, circularity criteria, which are uh, actually providing the waste film directives. So the usability, recyclability, presence of hazardous substances, Recycled content is missing. I hope it will be added uh, very soon because this is one of the uh, most important measures to pull uh, basically the demand for recycled materials. Um, but uh, one absolutely essential uh, point will be to uh, implement this uh, modulation of fees uh, to support uh, basically the fact that when producers are making a, a strong effort to design their products by not only uh, looking at the, the, the consuming the, the, the phase of consumption but also the end of life phase uh, this is properly reflected in the fees and then in the price to support basically consumer sustainable choices i always take the example of, of my mobile phone the fur phone if today i go in a shop and buy a fur phone um, or whatever phone that is being designed uh, to take into consideration reusability repairability recycle recyclability recycle content um, uh, up until now, in, in most uh, countries, if not all, there is no fee modulation and there is no price difference uh, for the consumer. This is also basically a point to show that EPR schemes shall then be also a, a tool uh, to make sure that those uh, positive externalities when we design products in such a way uh, that they are easier to recycle, that they incorporate recycled content, is obviously a way to tackle the market failure that can complement fiscal measures and other types of economic incentives, which uh, are equally important. Uh, point number two is, um, as recyclers, we are, have to compete to get uh, basically contracts um, and, and be then able to, to recycle the, uh, uh, the, 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 the end of life products, which uh, are subject to the tenders. And we see uh, in, in, in some countries a tendency for EPRs to become more operational in the sense either to um, have the ownership of the materials that have been processed when after the, the recycling of those processes or uh, eventually also have their own uh, facilities to uh, basically recycle waste which is uh, falling under the scope of, of those EPR. And here we do have a, um, um, a kind of a problem, I would say, and the need to have some principles to make sure that there is a, a fair competition between, on one hand, um, the EPR scheme, whose role is to, to coordinate, to collect, to coordinate, to implement fee modulation, and, and then organize the tenders, and us as recyclers, whose job is basically to apply, win the tenders, and then recycle the material. And, and this um, uh, tendencies is obviously something that is of, of concern to, to the recycling industry because um, we, we, we need to make sure that we do not have any unfair competition on those elements. And I, I think point number three, when it comes to uh, new EPR schemes, this is for sure, and we can see that a number of waste streams shall perform better, and there is then room for EPR, but I would also suggest or mention the fact that we do not always need EPR for all waste streams where there is no market failure, where the value of the materials is, is intrinsically high enough uh, to make sure that uh, collection and recycling takes place according to high standards, then there is no need for EPR. But when actually this is not the case, then EPR is an important policy option to be considered. And as Zurich, we have been supporting in EPR for textiles. And, and, and there are obviously other uh, waste streams which are equally important and for which EPR schemes can support uh, their development to, to become more circular. I'll stop here uh, and give back to you the floor, um, Arthur. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, and um, I think this is already starting uh, the discussions uh, that we have. I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but maybe I'm missing something. So please, uh, all the participants, and I see 71 people here, please feel free to, to make any questions, put any questions in the chat. And then now I would like to give the word to um, Timothy Glatz from Werner und Metz to tell um, the story from their perspective as a company. Timothy. Yes, thank you, Artur. Um, I don't know, I clicked on the slide. I don't see it on the screen, at least not on my screen. Is it 
Um, I think it is disabled, so can yes, thank you. So in 1991, um, uh, the packaging ordinance in Germany uh, came into force, uh, basically um, obliging all uh, yeah all companies that put packaging on the market to take back the packaging. It was the first comprehensive. Uh, uh, EPR legislation in the world. And in uh, 2012, so 20 years after it came into force, um, Bernard Matz decided to disrupt the current situation, which was very disappointing. Uh, more than 50% of the one and a half million tons that were collected in Germany of plastic packaging were incinerated and the rest was downcycled. And, uh, and, and everyone knows uh, back basically what the situation what the situation was in that uh, in that uh, moment, which basically hasn't really changed since uh, today. Uh, we wanted to disrupt and give a good example that it would be possible to take packaging uh, material, um, plastic packaging, actually PET, from the mixed collection, uh, sort it and recycle it back into our bottles. 2014, it was possible to put 20% from the mixed collection uh, PET into um, our finished uh, packaging um, and uh, since 2021 we have 50% which is technologically uh, possible we wanted to give the good example it has some uh, some ch some challenges which means at the end of course it is a little bit more complex the process and of course that makes it a little bit more expensive to use this recycled content i'm not going to elaborate on the current situation about pet uh, in europe and so on uh, i just want to give you a background of, of where we come from and basically what we see necessary to happen uh, concerning epr and that would be to incentivize the uptake of recycled content uh, in packaging um, uh, basically by a fee um, collected by, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it should be a neutral uh, organization, an EPR scheme, probably, uh, at least that's uh, my um, conception, um, uh, wouldn't be really um, able to take this neutral position um, and make a refund uh, for uh, PCR in packaging to those who do that, to the manufacturers actually. Uh, because it's supposed to be an incentive that really works. And, and why PCR and why from the mixed collection? Because that would also give the consumers uh, um, um, more or less uh, a concrete example for closing the loop and for the effort that the consumers um, are going through to also make the mixed uh, separate collection uh, possible. So basically bringing it back into the packaging would be the reason to incentivize uh, those manufacturers who actually um, fulfill this. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. And I'm glad to already see some questions in the chat. We'll come back uh, to those. And now, before we move on um, with two more uh, short introductions, um, I will want to launch the second poll. So I'll click immediately because it takes time. Um, and so I'm not sure if I need to do anything. Otherwise, maybe our technical assistants can launch the poll. It should read, do you agree that acumodulation needs to be implemented into, sorry, into extended producer responsibility schemes? And then I cannot just read it fully, but it's something about no EPR fee should be based on the cost for waste management. The second one is in principle, yes, but the fee should not be too high or something. I cannot read it. And then the third one, yes, and the fee should be high enough. Um, so um, I think it is green. So we're just probably just waiting for the delay and then the vote should come in. Um, is there anybody else who can see more already? Yeah, there, there they come. So one vote, four votes for the option three. And yes, and the eco-modulation of the fee should be substantial to reflect the true cost of the product from its negative environmental and social impact, but also a few in the middle and one is really against. So it should be just based on the costs for waste management, two votes. Okay, are there any further votes coming in? I don't think so. So 
Well, there's some uh, some discussion about that. Maybe we shall come back to that uh, after the introductions. So then I just click this away and, um, oh, maybe I sent it to you. Uh, so if it's correct, you will now also see the result. Um, and with that, um, I would give the floor to Marco Musso, Policy Officer on Fiscal Reform for Circular Economy and Carbon Neutrality from the EEB, the Environment, European Environmental Bureau. Marco. Thank you very much, Arthur. And uh, I'm also pleased to see the, the results of the poll, which gives a very good, uh, is a very good start for, for my presentation. Um, we are convinced that uh, extended producer responsibility, in fact, can and must be a, a crucial policy tool to prevent waste and to support the transition away from a throwaway culture towards a circular economy. Uh, to incentivize more circular products and to better implement the polluter pays principle, EPR requirements and eco-modulation, however, must be better aligned with the waste hierarchy, which means prioritizing value retention, reuse and repair before and beyond the current focus on uh, incremental improvements in the collection and in recycling. In terms of coverage, the use of EPR as a policy tool should be extended to other product categories, starting, for example, uh, from uh, furniture, textile, used oils, diapers and mattresses. And um, we also are convinced that uh, in order to ensure a true implementation of the polluter price principle, um, EPR fees must cover all real end of life costs, as well as the product, social and environmental externalities. And I refer here, for example, to the environmental and social externalities that come from an excessive use of single use or throwaway products. Um, for EPR to um, really realize its potential in supporting the reduction of waste and waste generation, it is essential to expand the scope of the fees beyond the current limited understanding of necessary costs. These costs only uh, consider uh, the one necessary for um, collection and recycling, and we feel it is time to uh, necessary to include costs that are needed to adopt waste prevention measures, such as for repair and for uh, reuse activities. The current cost coverage of EPR systems uh, only seeks to minimize costs for producers. Uh, however, in the pursuit of this cost minimization, EPR fees can and do become too low to encourage producer to redesign products with better environmental performances. We have conducted a study uh, with the Ecologic Institute, which demonstrated that um, for some product uh, covered by EPR, such as uh, electric and electronic waste, but also batteries and textiles, the EPR base fee plus the eco-modulation only constitutes a very small percentage of the overall product price, and it does not uh, reflect the true uh, end-of-life costs. This essentially removes the incentives for producers to invest in uh, better design for the circular economy, and also it uh, removes the price signals that is necessary for influence uh, consumers' uh, choices. Uh, I, I move um, to have a, a little bit more focused look at the role that eco-modulation um, can have. And, um, here uh, we can see how EPR and specifically the eco-modulation of EPR fees uh, must play a key role in the support of waste prevention target and reuse targets that uh, we want to see uh, set at EU level, uh, for example, via the revision of the Waste Framework Directive. And I was pleased to hear in this sense the, the commitment from the Commission to uh, implement better implement the waste hierarchy also through EPR. Um, and also these uh, waste prevention or use targets should be set in sectoral legislation. Today, as you can see, uh, EPR and eco-modulation is focused uh, almost exclusively on uh, end-of-life aspects, looking at criteria such as recyclability, sortability, recycling rate. Uh, however, the highest uh, level of the waste hierarchy are uh, largely overlooked. Uh, we are convinced that uh, there is an urgent need to uh, refocus the modulation criteria um, to, to really address waste prevention and, uh, and reuse. Specifically, the size of the uh, eco-modulation should vary depending on the proximity uh, to the highest level of the waste hierarchy, which means 
the criteria that lead to waste prevention and reuse, such as reparability and reusability, should lead to lower fees than criteria that focus only on end of life or only on recyclability. A final point that I would like to make before closing and leaving space for, for our discussion is that um, the EPR requirements and the fee modulation should be more clearly and more explicitly linked with uh, eco design criteria, which must be uh, set at EU level and must be uh, harmonized. Uh, this means, for example, to, to make an example for the case of packaging, eco modulation should then be uh, better bridged and aligned with the essential requirements for packaging that will be uh, revised uh, as part of the revision of the packaging and packaging waste directive. And uh, in closing, I thank you uh, everybody for, for listening. I look forward to the discussion with the panel and to any questions or comments from the participant. And I also invite everybody to have a look at, uh, at our report that we have produced with the Ecologic Institute when we looked at the uh, insufficient cost coverage of EPR fees for a number of uh, product categories that are currently um, covered by EPR. And then we also developed uh, a recommendation on how uh, the EPR system could be uh, reformed to take uh, better into account uh, the need to, for EU economy to focus on, uh, on waste prevention measures. Thank you very much, Arthur. I leave the floor back to you. Thank you, Marco, for your clear story. Um, now, before saying a few words myself, um, I would like to invite the two people who voted to, um, for the option in the poll to keep the, 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 say the, the fee based on the waste management only. If they could provide one or more arguments for why they think that is the better option, I think that would, would help for our discussion. So if, if, if those people are hearing this, please put it in the chat. That would be very helpful. And then just very briefly, um, I will try to be even more brief than the other speakers being the moderator as well. Uh, so um, uh, I represent Ecopreneur. And for those who don't know, Ecopreneur represents about 3000 um, companies. So this is a business federation in several member states. And all these companies are um, dedicated to sustainability. Um, and um, most of them are SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. Then I've met with about a thousand people working there. It's one of the larger companies. Um, now we produced a report in 2021, and this is a graph from that. And in this graph, we try to depict how we see the transition. We think that, that SMEs are much more important than everybody thinks. So that's one of the main messages of the report because 60% of pollution is coming from SMEs. And also they provide most of the solutions for circularity. But very important for this discussion is this line that you see here, this vertical line, um, that's, that states that new policies are needed for SMEs to grow and for established SMEs, sorry, for green SMEs, but also for established SMEs and the multinationals to have a turnaround to become circular. Um, and what is needed most of all is economic incentives. So um, it's maybe unreadable here, but it says that we need a tax shift and that we need eco-modulation of the EPR. There is not much else. So yeah, a VAT uh, deduction, that would also help, but that's uh, for most um, products forbidden uh, at the EU level. So that's why we think that EPR is so important. And we have specific recommendations for this. Uh, so first of all, uh, like I also said this morning in another session and yesterday, the current focus on product regulation is very important, but it is insufficient to create a circular economy. Um, economic incentives are urgently needed through a tax shift, reduce VAT rates, uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism and green public procurement, but very important to have accumulated schemes. Strong accumulation is the conviction of our companies uh, to extend it to more sectors like the EEB just said, also fostering circular business model models, including reuse and recycling. So not just recycling, also reuse to prevent things. Um, the important is harmonized across the EU and, and this is a technical one, but also crucial, no competition between schemes per sector. Some, co some countries have multiple schemes per sector for, for one sector, like for instance, electronics, and then you get comp competition on the accumulation and then it doesn't work anymore. So I'll stop here.
and now I would like to go um, to the discussion. Um, let me, so maybe somebody can remove my slide again so that we have no slides um, in, the, uh, in the visual part for everybody. And then, um, yeah, actually, I would like to go to the first question, uh, which basically states, yeah, as the, at the moment, um, the, the EPR schemes don't cover waste prevention and reuse. So this comes back to what Marco uh, introduced, but also Emmanuel, the need for echo modulation. And the question is, don't you think that financing prevention and reuse should be included among the minimum requirements for EPR schemes? And I am curious how those think about it that did not go into that. So first of, for of all, maybe Joachim, can you say something about this? Yeah, um, I think this is an interesting uh, approach. Huh? In most of the countries, reuse is uh, not included in EPR. It is uh, even la, 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 like in Germany excluded from from EPR. So I so I think the first step would be to to integrate it uh, in in the systems, uh, which would of course then go hand in hand with a reporting obligation, which would give us a chance to understand how much reuse do we have in the household sector and in the co co commercial sector, because I think a lot of information and data is missing up to now. And then, of course, we would have to integrate it in our fee system. Huh? So with all the options that the le legislation would give us. So I think that, that this would be a logical next step for for most of the countries. Huh? So uh, I think that that's something uh, that should be really assessed in detail with the, I don't know whether there are negative effects uh, happening, uh, but but I, I think that would be a good way forward. Thank you. Uh, just one follow-up question. I know it has been shown for, for plastic packaging that it works and that it does reduce uh, the waste stream, so preventing. Um, do you think packaging should be like the first sector to, to expand this on? Or do you think another waste stream would be optimal to use it, like textiles? Or is that too difficult? What do you think? See, I think for textiles we would f first have to have to set up the the framework. Huh? They are in most of the countries uh, really at the beginning. For pa packaging, that might be interesting, but uh, I'm always uh, asking not to be too black and white. Huh? And uh, of course, we always have to assess the consequences for uh, carbon new neutrality as well. Huh? So uh, we have to get better understanding. And if this is more circular and more more uh, carbon neutral or even positive, I think then there should be the respective rewarding as well. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia, can you say anything about plans for or the view from the European Commission about eco modulation? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I did mention it in my, my opening uh, statement that indeed for, for the Commission, we consider it as it uh, one of our priorities to to see how external producer responsibility can contribute to waste prevention efforts. Um, so this is currently um, on our table, so to say. So in uh, in the year 2023, uh, the Commission intends to table um, a targeted um, a review of the Waste Framework Directive. Um, and one of the intervention areas that we're looking at is indeed how we can improve waste prevention in the EU. Um, so it is in that context uh, that we will be assessing different kinds of measures, among them also the role of extended producer responsibility. And so in that context, we would be looking at um generally uh, on epr uh and specifically for the uh, specific waste uh, well, product streams that are that are already subject to extended producer responsibility so this process is ongoing so the impact assessment work has started and there 
Um, uh, so you can find more information on, on the Commission website on Javier Say portal, uh, where we will also in, in the coming weeks uh, launch the open public consultation. So everybody uh, will, will have the opportunity to express uh, their views on this topic and uh, um, and uh, yeah, be as specific as you as you would like, because indeed we are uh, going into this with a very um, uh, open mind. And also, I I'm I'm very glad to to hear already from from the panel and. Also also based on, on the questions that we get that uh, there is um, yeah there is support for uh, for this uh, for this road um, and uh, yeah in terms of the echo echo modulation so uh, I think this is one of the um, uh, one of the tools of course that can that in the context of EPR that can be um, used for that um, so we will be uh, looking at different kinds of measures including echo modulation on that so currently the waste framework directive minimum requirements list a number of um criteria for uh, eco modulation and uh, uh, so that could certainly be one area to um, uh, to elaborate on but also keeping very much in mind uh, the yeah the, the need to provide specificity to harmonize as much as possible um, the rules on EPR uh, across uh, across the EU. So, in the context of um, yeah, maybe sector specific legislation uh, and its specific EPR rules, I think that is also another avenue where more specific provisions can be can be placed. Uh, so, I think one example was on on the batteries regulation, where in the Commission's proposal we proposed specific uh, fee modulation criteria that we think were um, uh, appropriate for 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 batteries. Um, so th that was in in the end a, a more specific a lex specialis rule than it is in the waste from directive, which lists a number of criteria uh, to to be considered uh, by the member states. So this is also something that can be uh, considered in the future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, so the criteria that you're mentioning, they are general criteria if a member state wants to use it, but for the batteries, you made a specific case. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Yes. So indeed in the, in the waste from a directive, it, it's obliges um, the extended producer responsibility schemes to use the fee modulation, but it does not specify uh, concretely, which criteria it lists? It lists them as examples to be decided on what is more relevant for a specific uh, product. And so, I think this is where, um, yeah, member states uh, and the producer responsible organizations have that role to, uh, yeah, to, to make uh, their decisions. And so, for um, but in terms of looking at at the EU and looking at uh, the level playing field and and the impact on the industry, it would uh, it would make sense to to do this in as much as possible in a harmonized way. So therefore, when we're looking at product specific rules for EPR, that is where the Commission thinks we we should do um you know a more precise uh, a regulatory framework and propose more concrete criteria which we think are relevant for for such products and so that's why in the batteries regulation we proposed uh, yeah specific criteria that uh, that essentially deviate from the ways from a directive but deviate not in the sense that uh, uh, it, it is uh, of, a, of a lesser importance but it, we just propose criteria that uh, would actually um, uh, enable that fee modulation that is uh, that is meaningful, uh, without adding unnecessary burdens on the extended producer response uh, schemes that uh, that manage this uh, fee collection. Because e every time you modulate, uh, it adds costs to to the administration of the scheme, and therefore also lessens the impact of that. Uh, uh, of that uh, exercise, in particular, on on the smaller producers, uh, for whom this cost uh, is is certainly a bigger burden than than for for others, irrespective of whether they put more sustainable products on the market or not. So that that is also a consideration. Um, yeah, we need we need to keep in mind. 
no, and, and indeed, um, representing SMEs, I fully rec uh, recognize the importance of keeping the uh, administrative burden low. At the same time, uh, eco-modulation would definitely help our members because they are front runners and they're currently not or hardly rewarded for their efforts. Um, which reminds me, maybe Timothy, uh, you can say something from uh, the perspective of Werner Ugnert's company. Yes, thank you, Arthur. Well, <clears throat> correctly, we are representing um, lastly, um, those who have to um, fulfill these additional um, burdens, which means um, administration, bureaucracy, uh, costs. And, and I think it's extremely important that we keep in mind it should uh, always be uh, something that is implementable. That's uh, being, yeah, ideally simple. It's uh, ideally also a strong incentive to change your behavior to, like in our case, in the case I mentioned, uh, to, to use recycled content from the, from, from, from the mixed packaging collection, um, since it's um, um, at a higher cost in the market, um, especially right now. Um, so again, it should, eco-modulation should lead to uh, a different um, um, behavior, but also spark innovation, which is also extremely important in a, I think uh, someone mentioned it, a failed market. I would call the plastic packaging recycling a failed market. Um, it hasn't worked uh, um, over 30 years in, in Germany and um, at least not for an upcycling or high quality closed loop um, because it's just a little bit more expensive to, um, to take recycled content from the mixed collection. And, and, and knowing the figures around uh, climate uh, uh, relevance of uh, production of virgin plastics, uh, it should be a very high uh, priority for the Commission to make sure that uh, existing uh, uh, material sources uh, should be used in, in, a, in a very sustainable uh, uh, um, way, which basically means mechanical recycling of, uh, of uh, packaging, of plastic packaging. Um, and and, and then the, that exactly should be more or less set in a, in a clear frame that is um, um, also a level playing field for, for all the participants. Um, and, and if I understand correctly, um, then that should also be something that um, should be also part of the SPI uh, from the EU Commission, which uh, should set this uh, level playing field this clear um, also a framework uh, or at least the basis for, for the regulation, um, the product specific regulations, um, um, and also including EPR. Thank you. Merci. Um, I'm uh, thinking, um, is uh, maybe does uh, Emmanuel or Sylvia or anybody, Marco, wants to make any like more remarks about the echo modulation? Otherwise, I would like to switch to the second question that we got. Uh, the, the only thing that I want to, to mention on eco modulation, and here I think I fully agree with what uh, Sylvia and um, uh, Timothy ha have mentioned, is that. <clears throat> we need to have a minimum harmonization and whether the criteria for waste prevention, recyclability or recycled content, uh, we need to make sure that they are um, specific enough to be enforceable in practice and that the magnitude of the modulation will be sufficient to trigger that uh, basically change that we uh, are, are all aiming at. So that for instance, a more recyclable product or a product that is using recycled content or both, um, uh, we have a, 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 a much more attractive modulation of fees or even a bonus, which will uh, give it, uh, give to, 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 to that product um, a benefit and which will also trigger a change in the market so that what a company like uh, Werner Hermetz Werner, Werner are doing, sorry for the pronunciation, is uh, no longer going to be the exception, but rather than the rather the, the rule, and this is absolutely essential. And then, obviously, you, you may have the question of, of the governance and whether the governance in place um, can actually support uh, that change and such a, an important modulation. But that I think we will need a bit more time to 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 to, to have that discussion. 
Yo, um, Emmanuel, sorry. Uh, how then would you get support from existing industry? Because my personal experience is uh, in the Netherlands that you can have a discussion about eco-modulation of the fees, but industry will only agree if the fee, fee is low, because otherwise they see that their products will be like, uh, yeah, cannot be sold anymore. They will become too expensive if you make the fee high enough for eco-modulation to be effective. How do you see that? But then this is also where you can, and, and getting back to what has been said, the, the waste legislation is being revised, and this is where you can really link uh, objective criteria linked to the recyclability to, to the modulation and try really to have an harmonization at, at European level. So this is uh, something that is essential. Then there is obviously the question of, of, you know, how fast and how far you can go with the magnitude of the fee and, and not obviously have an impact on social acceptance. I mean, we see uh, a huge inflation across Europe and this is a real question to be, to be asked. But we need to have the, the incentive factor in the modulation for the modulation to be effective. So there is a balance to be struck. And I think here that putting, having specific criteria to make sure that uh, basically the modulation of fees is uh, based on objective criteria, supporting waste prevention, uh, waste uh, recycling, the use of recycled materials is, is, is absolutely essential. And uh, just to, to, to interfere very, very quickly, um, we have countries, in the few countries where we have eco-modulation already, we have partly differences of 400 euros per ton. And I think this is already a, re a relevant difference. Huh? In some countries, like in, 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 in Germany, we see the problem that within competing PROs, you are not able to, to uh, install a fee modulation. That's why they are proposing this fund mo model, which takes, of course, a lot of time. But in several other countries, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, France, we have already modulation. And I think it is showing step by step uh, 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 an effect. We just have to just have to roll it out now to the rest of the country countries huh? but in some countries e industry is still paying less than the 400 euros difference huh? not to talk about some poland uk and so on so uh, hmm? we, we we have to put it a little bit in perspective as well huh? thank you thank you for that and with that hey, sorry arthur very quickly if i may i also wanted to add to what uh, emmanuel and Jochen said to to stress that when uh, fees will become uh, sufficiently significant because they really cover uh, the true uh, end of life costs, then this could be and should be communicated to consumers through visible fees and separate invoicing. And that could then also, first of all, be more transparent, but also explain the differences in costs and um, allow for a more effective uh, eco-modulation while involving uh, and informing consumers. I think this might be more relevant for uh, products with uh, with the product prices and more significant than packaging, but as we're now really looking at the extension of EPRs to other product categories, it might be interesting to also look at uh, visible fees. And I, I would like to add, and I know we, we, we time is limited, that uh, fee modulation goes both ways. If your product is highly uh, sustainable, then the fee is lower, and this is the the, the incentive effects that we are seeking to make sure that. Uh, the, producers will be aiming and, 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 and get to, to go in that direction. So it, it shall go both ways. If your product is sustainable, whether it's a, an electrical or electronic appliance, or whether it's a packaging product, uh, if, if you are designing it in a way which make, makes it uh, easier to recycle and use recycled content at end of life, then you should benefit from it and your modulation should be much lower or even give a, a bonus to, 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 that, to, to, to that product when it's placed on the market. I totally agree. Uh, okay, now we now have like 10 minutes and even less left because we will, we will also have conclusions from Emmanuel. Uh, but just briefly, maybe go to the second question, which states there is so much uh, construction um, waste. Uh, and now the renovation wave is coming up uh, as part of the Green Deal. So shouldn't there be an EPR on construction and demolition waste implemented, harmonized in the EU? Um, Joachim, to start with? 
uh, I I see in the, the, this field, of course, the big pro problem to, to to whom to make responsible, and of course we have a lot of uh, old stuff huh? in pa packaging. The turnover is quite quick quickly, so we do not have to to bother a lot uh, with, with the existing stuff. For we it was already div difficult, but to to ask the the current uh, producers of construction material to pay for matters that were constructed 30, 40, 100 years ago, there I see the big, biggest challenge how this this should work. But in general, I, I think it's a tool that can work for every waste stream. Hmm? So also for the construction sector, you, you think it would be feasible to, when, for instance, when a new building is placed or when a thing is renovated and you can really still have control about the way it is demolished afterwards, that you would include like a demolition fee at that at that time? Do you think that would demolition be? Demolition fee, yes. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Yeah, no, no. I, I think there could be an e EPR system for, for new buildings. Yeah. Is the European Commission is this on the radar of the European Commission with the construction sector being a priority sector, Sylvia? Yes, uh, indeed. So construction sector is uh, yeah, widely reflected in in the Commission's uh, policy documents. Uh, so it, it is it is something that the, several uh, Commission services are are working on to ensure that uh, this renovation is as ambitious as possible. But on the other hand, as well, we need to to, to manage uh, the waste uh, that this would uh, generate in the best possible way. And so in in that context. Uh, I can. Uh, I would first. I would like to recall that um, the Commission is actually tasked to look at the construction and demolition waste stream, um, and uh, assess the feasibility of setting waste management targets. So, in relation to uh, prevention, preparation for reuse, recycling, recovery, and and landfill restriction. Uh, restriction. So, this is something that the Commission uh, is commencing the work on. Um, with the with with the objective of uh, yeah in the in the coming next uh, two three years uh, um, advancing it um, so that uh, that is something that that should be on the radar of uh, uh, for 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 that uh, sector and indeed extended producer responsibility could be considered as part of I mean as part of the set of measures uh, to facilitate uh those waste management objectives that will be considered um but i mean as uh, joachim uh, mentioned so one um one very critical point in in this discussion is indeed uh, on on retroactivity so whether you can actually impose obligations on actors um uh, retroactively to manage something that they were not obliged to do when they put the product on the market and therefore could not have uh, uh, consider those costs uh, within the uh, within the product cost, and in fact, I would like to draw your attention to a recent court judgment that uh, specifically um, uh, looked into this aspect. So it is, uh, yeah. So it is definitely uh, on the radar, including extended producer responsibility uh, uh, provisions, and that is something that, uh, yeah, will be, um, yeah, in the work in progress for the next uh, couple of years. I think that is good news. Um, anybody else who wants to comment on this about the construction waste? If not, I think that I will switch to Emmanuel Katrakis for uh, some concluding remarks so that we can end this session actually in time. Emmanuel? Yeah, well, first, I would like to, yeah, on, on construction, the demolition the waste. Uh, we are working on it, so right now I don't want to, to, to give too much uh, information, but uh, there, there should be different policy options to be pursued to, to improve uh, both uh, the, the collection, recycling and the end markets for construction products. One of the problems with, with the construction products is that intrinsically they have a very long lifespan and the legislation, um, especially for chemicals, for instance, is has become extremely strict for, for for good reasons but then we have problems with construction demolition waste that are sometimes more specific to to that stream where intrinsically as i just mentioned the the, the waste that uh, that uh, recyclers are 
are going to process um, do come and do have a very long uh, lifespan. Obviously, for everything that relates to, to concrete, to, 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 to the minerals that are being used in construction, uh, action uh, will be uh, needed to, to make sure that we can increase uh, the recycling and the competitiveness of the sector in relation to, 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 to linear value chains, which still have a very strong uh, competitive pitch. Now, I, to be frank, I'm extremely pleased of, of the outcome of, of that session because um, we wanted very strongly to discuss about uh, EPR and especially EPR linked to the modulation of fees. If properly implemented, and, and, and it's, it's also good to see that uh, some, some countries are already uh, 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 modulating fees with a magnitude that will have an impact on the market, this can be a game changer. And I found it extremely interesting to uh, hear both from, from Expra, who, is and who, who gave the opening words about the role that EPR schemes play, but also from the, the not only the feelings, but the experience from, from a producer who uh, basically much even earlier, but before the, 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 there was the, the, the new circular economy action plan and the changes in legislation, um, made the effort to, uh, to try to market products, not to try, but to, to manage to market products which are uh, more sustainable, packaging especially products with, with recycled content and to hear from, from, from him. Um, I see also an, a shift which uh, um, to, to try to support waste prevention and see to which extent waste prevention and EPR can, can support each other. I must say, here speaking a bit for, for the recycling industry, we have always been supportive of the waste hierarchy. We obviously promote recycling, but uh, waste prevention happens before in the value chain. So um, I, I would say here, um, both uh, can go hand in hand. There might be sometimes um, a few, um, it's not hiccups, but uh, uh, criteria to be, to be properly defined. But just one thing I may say, um, when it comes to batteries, for instance, on all the complex waste streams, we see that um, criteria to support repair will also support dismantling of complex products, especially e-waste, and will be self-supportive um, in, in, in many instances. So um, it's very difficult to conclude, especially when we have an online event, because despite obviously the polls and, and the Myra board, we, we are lacking, I would say, that direct interaction from, from the audience uh, to know obviously how, how you feel, but also to share more practical expertise. Um, so eventually, I don't know whether, Cynthia, it's already too early for you to give a, a first um, outcome of the Myra board or, or, or of, of the feedbacks you have used. I might give you the floor for, for a few seconds. Uh, for the rest, I would say there is a lot of work in, in progress. Um, within the leadership group, we still need to do uh, more uh, work on, on EPR. So it was extremely useful to have that discussion today. And on the other hand, we obviously see that the Commission uh, has EPR uh, high on its agenda as a policy tool to support the transition towards the circular economy, which means with us as stakeholders, regardless of the uh, uh, business or NGO interest we represent, we do have a lot of work on how plate. I'll stop here. I don't want, I don't, I, I would like to ask Cynthia whether you already can give a very small um, outcome of, of, of the Mara board or whether you want to say a few words because I understand the Mara board will be, will continue to be opened um, after the end of that session. Thank you, Emmanuel. Um, yes, right now we're seeing that there's quite a bit of feedback on criteria regarding uh, LCA environmental impacts and results, uh, virgin material use versus recovered material use, the social impacts. And we're also seeing a lot of information about the negative externalities, um, how to set targets for EPRs to reduce virgin material use rates, and quite a few long content um, uh, responses there. So. Um, I'm pleased to see that there's a lot of feedback from the, the audience and we will leave this open for the next uh, 24 hours to be able to allow people to take in the uh, information and provide their feedback. Thank you. Thank you and I'm extremely pleased of, of those sorts of feedback because uh, as recyclers we, we have to compete and we compete with uh, primary materials and, and those externalities um, linked to, to extraction and processing are often, if not never, internalized in price. So if EPR can, can also
level playing field that would be uh, something that that uh, we strongly support and that uh, uh, put us back to to the importance of modulation i will close the session unless there is a very last me a very last sentence that or, or comment that somebody would like to make I'd like to thank all the speakers thanks everyone yes. participants all the best see you soon hopefully in real life huh? bye 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 thank you and bye bye